Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, aboard the physics spaceship. So, previously, we have looked at several skills or several tools we can use to understand the distance to certain objects in the universe uh, by looking at its brightness, also known as the radiant flux intensity. And how we find the luminosity? We use standard candles and we looked at two types. One is a CIFID variable, one is a supernova. Then we also looked at wind's displacement law, how we can use the color or the wavelength of a certain glowing object to determine the temperature. And from temperature, we determine the radius and how big that object is. Today, we're going to go a little bit further. We're going to answer the question or think about the question. When you see something in the night sky and it appears to be a little bluish or reddish, does that mean it's really hot or really cold? Is there something else? Turns out there's another uh, factor of physics that affects the color that you see. This is no stranger to us. We have seen this topic before and it is known as the Doppler effect. But before we go to the Doppler effect, we need to recap a lot of basic AS stuff first. So we're going to rewind uh, AS and A2 stuff. So we're going to rewind and say, how do we use color to determine how fast objects are moving in the universe? But first, some prerequisite recap. So the first thing we need to remember is this thing called absorption spectrum. We learned this before in quantum physics chapter. Go check out the videos, rewatch a little bit, revise if you need to remember it. So there's this thing called the line emission spectra, okay, or also known as the absorption spectrum, different different ways. Lah. So the idea is hot gas, especially in the center of a hot source like a star here, it emits white light. Okay, so the hot interior of a star in this case. Also known as hot gas, lah. it's very, very, very hot in the middle, you know, very hot. And this white light is continuous spectrum continuous spectrum continuous spectrum meaning there's all wavelengths so if you look at the picture down here continuous spectrum you got all rainbows of the color all 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 the wavelength okay so on this white light will pass through the outer layers of the star so the outer layers of the star usually is what we call a colder or cool gas imagine the there's many layers of the star, right? Very hot middle and the outer there's like more cooling-ish kind of gas. So whatever light is released from the middle goes out. You have to pass through all these layers of gas. So this white light will pass through the cooler outer layers of the star. So here's a throwback to a quantum cool gas, hot gas thing. If you didn't have that layer of cool gas, you would have a continuous spectrum like this. So, for example, a graph. Do we have a graph here? Oh, we do. Okay, so if we have a graph of the emission spectra, if it was continuous, it would just be all the wavelengths. Okay, this is a graph of intensity against wavelength lambda. Ooh, color is changing. Okay, all, all the wavelengths. Maybe some stronger, some weaker. But if you pass through a coal gas, your light or photons goes past through cold gas and comes through it, turns out this cold gas will absorb some wavelengths. And those wavelengths are specific to what type of gas it is. So if this hydrogen gas, hydrogen only will absorb certain wavelengths. So instead of seeing a continuous spectrum like that, what you will see is this continuous spectrum but with some dark lines. These dark lines are specific for hydrogen or for whatever cool gas is at the surface of the star. So the dark lines means some wavelength has been absorbed and those wavelengths absorbed is specific for hydrogen. So, big brain time, if I'm a scientist and I'm like, if I can see the, color, the emission of the star and I see this dark line, I can tell what is the star made of. Is it a hydrogen surface star? Is there other elements? I just need to look at these dark lines right here. So. How, uh, how it might look like in some, I mean, in real life, it looks more messy. Lah, but this is a very simplified version of how the graph could look like, where you have a continuous spectrum here, but you notice there are certain dark lines and dips. One, two, uh, there's one, two, three, four. So there's four dips and they will find the specific wavelength, 300 something, 600 something, and people can identify, oh, this is the absorption spectrum of hydrogen. Hence, Hydrogen is on the surface of the star. That's it. Okay. So it's a throwback to also our A, 
A2 chapter. This is a snippet from MJ20 P41, where they will ask you basically the same thing from quantum physics. White light pass through a cloud of low pressure gas. As you can see, white light comes in, continuous spectrum, go through, some wavelengths are missing. Why is that? So they'll say the continuous spectrum is seen to contain a number of dark lines. Explain what is these dark lines. Basically what we did just now, but for four marks, you got to write it in the essay. So I'm just going to show you the mask scheme because we're going to, this is just a recap of what we learned before. So what's up with all these dark lines? The backstory is, revision time, inside hydrogen, there are specific hydrogen energy levels. Yeah. So there's electrons here. So if you have a photon comes in, oh, what, what, what is being absorbed but not purple? Let's choose... Let's choose um let's let's choose green. Okay, this one here. So if green color come mm, actually no no no. The biggest jump should be red, right? Okay, let's use red. Fine, let's do orange. Let's do this one. So if a orange color photon comes in, that matches exactly the difference in energy level, then this electron will excite. Go up to a higher energy level. Great. Absorbed. But it can't stay up there for long. Eventually you have to de excite. So when the electron de-excite goes down to a lower energy level, it will release that exact same wavelength, but thrown in whatever random direction. So imagine there's three friends, photons. What is the colors? Orange, red, green, blue, purple, green, pink. I don't know. I'm just going to put all the photons. The moment all these friends go through a cloud of coal gas, and only blue makes it through, only red makes it through. Where did all the others go? Absorbed and thrown somewhere else in whatever direction. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it's in the correct direction, maybe it's not. Okay, so let's say these three make it through. The other two, lost. So what will you see on the other end? You will see all the colors except those that are lost or thrown or scattered somewhere else due to our cool gas. That's the whole idea here. So... That's why you talk about the steps. Photon gives energy to electron, you excite. Electron moves to higher energy level. Of course, your photon must match the difference in energy level. And this is a calculator, calculated from HF or HC over lambda. Throwback to quantum physics. So eventually, you got to de-excite. got to come down from the high energy state. When you de-excite, you emit photons in all directions. So you may not necessarily see that mu as much of that photon that's why it is dark there's not many photons left okay so that's our recap of the quantum energy level quantum physics chapter there's one more thing you need to recap so we know that we'll see dark lines but we discover that you know there's this thing called the doppler effect and all the waves length can shift around depending on how fast the object is moving so a quick recap on what a Doppler effect is. This is from our AS chapter. We learn once upon a time. Doppler effect is also known as the apparent change in frequency or wavelength, actually. Due to what we call relative motion. Between who? Between the source where the light is coming out and the observer. So in the diagram down here, the source in our case is going to be a light source, like a star. Something that's glowing. And if the star is moving to the left, like this diagram shows, you have an observer on the left, which will see that a wavelength has become slightly shorter. So this person said, ooh, look at the wavelength here. The wavelength has become shorter than what it actually is because of the nature of the motion of the object. This will make colors appear to move towards the blue spectrum. You're saying, Miss, why blue? Ah? Okay, time to time to do our... <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find a nice color. Okay, red, blue. Okay, so blue is on the side of shorter wavelength. If you look at the visible spectrum, red is on the side of longer wavelength or aka lower frequency. Blue is shorter wavelength or aka higher frequency. So if I were to draw, it will be like this. If I were to draw red's wavelength, it will be nice and long. Okay, so wavelength becomes shorter. We call this blue shift. Blue shift. Not exactly become blue, but it moves towards the bluish color of the spectrum. Any, any light will move towards the bluish color. On the other hand, 
if you are the other observer and let's label let's label these observers on the right side you observe that the star or the source is receding from you receding basically means moving away uh. on the other side the source is let's write source is approaching means going towards you wavelength becomes shorter appears blue source is receding means moving away of course here now you see wow this wavelength is now so long so the wavelength appear to become longer the star is still releasing the same wavelength okay this is lambda same but it appears to you to become longer this of course is called redshift why because longer wavelength is towards the red color no? so any wave any any frequency maybe there's a, a black line here Ooh. A black line here, it will move towards the left. That will be called a red shift. So, when we put these ideas together, we can actually tell, based on the absorption spectra, how fast a star is moving towards or away from you. Here's an example of how the absorption spectrum could look like. So, firstly, the original rest frame is if the object is not moving. You will see these dark lines in certain places. One, two, three, four, five. And they all have their own wavelength. So maybe this one is like, I don't know, 700 nanometer or something like that. Lah. People will measure. Redshift is if the object is moving away. And you notice how all these lines have kind of moved towards the reddish spectrum. Red, see? Uh, move already. Everything moved. All shifted. So scientists will say, okay, I recognize these four lines as hydrogen absorption lines, but their numbers are not quite right. So maybe this one is like 7, 10 nanometers. Like it's a bit off. And not just one line, but all the lines are shifted. Maybe this one is a... Uh, blue is what color? Uh, uh, 450 nanometers. I'm just throwing numbers here. So this one, 4, 5, 1 nanometers. Oh, it, it shifted. And they will conclude that, okay, based on the shift in black lines or dark lines, that means this object is moving away from us. Of course, the other way, could also happen if the object is moving towards us on Earth. We still identify, okay, this is lines 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but their values now are a bit smaller, so maybe this is 690. We know it's hydrogen, but the values are a bit off, and off in a consistent manner. So we know, okay, this object is moving towards us, that's why the wavelength is different. All right. Now, if you find it hard to imagine, here's a quick demo for you. So you see me, this is my, let's call this my natural color. This is how I'm supposed to look like to you. But if I'm moving away from you, I will appear to be re redder. Ah, oh, like it's redder. Ah, see, I become so red. So I'm floating in space, moving away from you. I'm becoming redder. But, but, I'm floating around. If I'm approaching you, I will appear to look bluer. So I'm going towards you at a certain speed. That's why I appear blue. So remember, I am still the same color, but if I'm moving towards you, I'm bluish. If I'm moving away from you, I become orangish, reddish. That's the whole idea of the Doppler effect. So the new equation you need to know that is specific for a Doppler redshift is that the shift in wavelength over the reference wavelength, in our case, if you have a rest frame, that will be your reference wavelength, usually. That is roughly approximately equal to also the change in frequency over the original frequency, which is approximately equal to the speed the object is moving over the speed of light. So this one, got to memorize this. So let's label a little bit what all these terms mean. So lambda here refers to the change in wavelength. Change in wavelength. Uh, I guess for ease of reference, you could just calculate the delta lambda as your whatever star wavelength you see minus whatever you see in the lab or your reference wavelength. Yeah. Oftentimes, there will be uh, emission or absorption spectra you see in the lab. So that's the change in wavelength. The lambda down there is your reference wavelength. So this is reference or your lab wavelength what should be the wavelength that you want to observe if the object were not moving relative to that okay for frequency is the same thing 
change the wavelength over reference. Now for the V on the other side, it's labeled here. This V here is the speed of the source. Oftentimes it's a star. And C here is the speed of light. So these are all ratios. Let me put a box around this, this equation. I don't think it's given the best double check. Or you could just memorize the little ratio over here. Okay, so make sure you know this thing and how to use it. Check out some examples that will come after this video. Okay, so let's look at some last scenarios that can potentially come out. So in application, astronomers will observe all these colors uh, of the galaxy. And for lab reference, it's down here. Maybe you're supposed to see these dark lines. Nearby galaxy, you notice that the lines have moved. There's a lot more black lines as well because there could be interstellar cloud that absorb the wavelength. Maybe some random asteroid. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that can absorb the wavelengths. If you go even further, you see an even greater shift. Very distant galaxy is basically very dark, lots of black lines. And the lines that you identify is really, really, really shifted. So the further you are away, the more shifted it is. Hmm. That's actually in the final topic video coming up next uh, about what 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 this shift tells us we're going to learn about the cosmological redshift and how we realize that by just looking at colors actually everything is moving away from everything or at least from our point of view all the galaxies are moving away from us so all the colors we see are actually a little bit red shifted redder than what they actually are but we'll pause that leave that for the next video lah huh one that I would like to remind you of is a somewhat AS topic that is combined with the A2 topic called circular motion. Ooh, so many questions I can create out of this. So remember, if object moves towards you or away from you, you see a different color. Well, it could, the object could be moving in circular motion. If this object, for example, is moving towards you. Okay, let's pretend our, we, we, we are the observer, like um, our eye is here. And this object is spinning around the sun. Sure. Sometime, at some point in the circular motion, the tangential velocity is in such that it is moving towards you. See this white arrow that I draw down here. So if you're the observer, you would see uh, the absorption spectra shift towards the blue. Blue shift is because object is moving towards you. Okay. But at some other point in time, maybe the object is just moving perpendicular to your line of sight so remember the eye is here on the right then there wouldn't be any shift it's just neutral okay so this would be your red this would be your reference this is in the case of object that is spinning like the universe spirals and things like that uh, on the other hand if the object is in circular motion but moving away from you at a certain point then this is its tangential velocity or speed Tangential velocity moving away and it's moving away is red shifted so you see all these dark lines shift or move migrate towards the red end of the visible spectrum so this is towards down here and away okay so this is not i mean it's circular motion yes but it has this kind of question has appeared before in as actually wow look at this it look familiar does it look familiar MJ18 P11 Q24. I think there's a video on this somewhere. But we'll just browse through it since we're actually learning it now. So binary star, two stars rotating around. Light from one of the stars is observed on Earth. Circular motion. Observe frequency varies. And you see this fancy graph which we have never seen before, but it's possible to come out. So it, sometimes you see maximum frequency, minimum frequency, maximum frequency, minimum frequency. This is the same star that is going around and we're watching the frequency. So the rate of rotation of the binary star increases. Why is the change to maximum and minimum frequency? Okay, we got to slow down. We're like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Rate of rotation refers to what? Angular frequency. Oh. Means it's spinning faster. Means if you have any velocity, okay, if the object is coming towards you, it's faster. If the object is moving away from you, it's faster moving away from you. So red shift, blue shift, higher. So you can also say that, oh, remember, uh, blue shift is 
wavelength become shorter, right? Or in other words, frequency increase. On the redshift side, the wavelength becomes stretched or in other words, frequency decrease. So you would have a, 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 a maximum frequency and a minimum frequency. Okay, so this is the maximum frequency and minimum frequency and that would have changed if you rotate faster or you rotate slower. So what is the change to f max and f min? Let's look at the table answers. So maximum frequency would increase because now if you can move faster, your frequency increase even more. So the maximum is even higher already. Lor. So you got increase. Minimum frequency already very low. But if you go away even faster, you stretch out the wavelength even more, it's even more rate shifted. So the wavelength drops even lower. So basically, if you're moving away faster, frequency decrease even more. So the minimum is even lower, even more red. So here we got to go, go for a decrease, decrease even more. So best choice here will be C. So AS, but also A2 question. Very nice, circular motion. So remember, as long as an object is moving, the wavelength emitted, which we can identify by the black lines, are moving or being are shifting around depending on how they are. So in this case of circular motion, it's a bit more complicated. But yeah, you just know that it's just dancing around, like, okay? They will ask you to link together some circular motion equations if you need to. Uh, but know that the core idea is the Doppler shift. Now before I end this video, there's one more bonus thing that I need to I can give you, and this is a uh, perhaps a tip for P5 paper five. You know we talk about all these wavelengths, right? Actually, how do we measure wavelength? We know how to measure wavelength, but you gotta apply your AS knowledge. How do we know, like, if I get this picture, how would I know, like, this line is 690 nanometers? Oh, we gotta do... We, we, gotta, we gotta know our experimental setup. So here is a quick reminder on how do we measure wavelength with actual instruments. The first one is our old friend called the diffraction grating. Second one is called our double slit. Usually people use a diffraction grating. And both of these are, you know, based on the machine. They are used in the machine called a spectrometer. One of the ways are. So a diffraction grating is just a piece of glass that has many lines cut on it that you cannot see. Okay. And you would see something like this. Now how do we get this picture? Well, basically you have a lamp that looks pink color-ish. This is a discharge tube a hot gas okay it's releasing it's a hydrogen lamp i think it's hydrogen and then you put the grating here so here's the grating here's the light source okay and then you put your eye here and the camera is now what you are seeing okay so whatever light comes through will pass through the grating will split up in this case, it split pink color, splits into blue and red and a whole bunch of other colors. So this is the lamp that you suppose to see with your eyes. But when it passes through the grating, you see this whole nice pattern because all the light spread out in simple terms, spread out to a whole collection of lines that you can see. Okay, so this is how a diffraction grating experiment works. So what you need to do is you can put your ruler and you would measure the distance between consecutive bright fringes. In this case, I say light blue looks very clear. I will measure the, the distance, for example. And by that, I can calculate the wavelength. Now, how does that work? Okay, so in this case, we're going to draw a diffraction grating. Just give you a recap. You will need the grating here. Usually, it's very small. I just draw it very big. Okay, grating, and you need a screen. How do you calculate the wavelength? Or oh, let's say we have a laser light that comes in. Okay, uh, what we call the zero order is the middle one. N equals zero. N equals one. That will be here. Now, if you have another wavelength, such as red, also coming in, then that wavelength will have a different angle. Maybe their N equals to one is here. Wait, wrong. Red color should diffract more, right? So N equals one maybe is over here. N equals zero is overlap. So you would see a bright line right there. You would see another bright line right here. What you need to find is the angle. So for the green color, for example, I don't know what wavelength is this. What wavelength is this? 
you calculate the angle of diffraction by finding the distance. Then you use your equation n lambda equals d sine theta. So measure angle, plug in the equation. D here refers to the, the, the diffraction grating line spacing. Line spacing, uh, D. Uh. Okay, so if you know, usually it will be written on the slide, the diffraction grating slide. So what you can do is write that down or just say that you will measure this. So this is useful for paper 5 if you ever have to measure wavelength. The other friend is our double slit experiment. Instead of many, many, many slits, you only have two slits. And remember this diagram? You have the wave will spread out. The wave will interfere with each other and you form bright fringe, dark fringe. Okay, this is our AS. We are a bit lazy to draw this whole thing. So we'll just say, okay, here's your double slit slide. You send in, a, let's say, an orange laser or whatever light source come in. It will spread out into bright and dark fringes. So one, two, three, four, five. Ah, yeah, I just draw like that lah. So you will need a slide, a slide, a screen. Here's your slit. And on the screen, you will see bright, dark, bright, 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 bright. These are what we call bright fringes. And all you need to do is measure the distance between consecutive bright fringes. Okay, so specifically for double slit. If you use fringe separation, if you can see it, then you can use this equation. Lambda equals to AX over D. Okay, so FYI, these are tools you can use to measure wavelength in case they ever ask you or in case you ever need to talk about it in paper 5. But I think that's all for today. Whew, everything you need to know to understand the Doppler effect and all the AS and prerequisite knowledge that is required. So that's all for this video. Go, go look at some examples and we'll see you in the last part to wrap up the final conclusion. What did we conclude when we discovered that things are moving away or towards us in the universe? That's all for this video. See you in the next one.